Well, I have to, in, in regards to John's comment, I have to uh, actually give the accolades to my partner in crime, uh, Rick McDermott, for putting these sessions into the uh, advances meeting, uh, even if they haven't made it to the AGA's clinical conference yet. And uh, I don't need to give much of an obituary because I think you just saw who killed Marcus Welby. <laughs> but here we go. The news release recently from September 23rd, 1969 through July 19th, 1976 in Santa Monica, the life of Marcus Welby, a private practitioner who was found dead after a medical show was canceled. He apparently committed suicide. The, left he, the note he left to the producers suggested depression. And by the way, Rick's going to hand out Prozac for all of you as you leave the uh, room tonight. And the increasing emotional stress due to the burden of administrative paperwork, along with the pressure from gay activists who had boycotted his show. Here's Marcus Welby and, of course, his partner in crime, uh, Dr. Stephen Kiley. These two were contrasting figures with Marcus Welby being the older um, but somewhat more liberal uh, clinician, whereas uh, Dr. Kiley uh, was actually uh, much more evidence-based and, uh, quote, modern at that time. Uh, Marcus was a widower, survived by his daughter, Sandy, and her son, Phil. These partners in practice were, in my view, uh, a white coat extension of Father's Knows Best. Now, I'm afraid that much of the audience doesn't get this, Rick. You got it. <laughs> the two try to treat people as individuals in an age of specialized medicine and uncaring doctors. He was a symbol of a, the, quali the uh, quote from his obituary stated that Dr. Welby was a symbol of traditional physician archetype that was already fading from reality. This is in the late uh, 1970s the cradle-to-grave general practitioner that took care of patients in the clinic, in the hospital, and at their homes. In the first episode of Marcus Welby, he gave a speech to the uh, medical students, and he described general practice it performed standing up, sitting down, outdoors, indoors, wherever there's illness. And that means everywhere, because gentlemen, at that time, the majority of physicians were men, we don't treat fingers or skin or bones or skulls or lungs or Crohn's or whatever. We treat people, entire human people. The Welby persona was one of a wise grandfather who spent unlimited time with patients, listening to their complaints, learning about their family issues, diagnosing their problems with the acumen of an osler. He used only his ears to hear the story, his well-honed physical skills, and a few simple instruments that he kept in his black bag. You can leave your bags at the gate when you leave as well. He made house calls and never seemed to receive a complaint about his bills. In fact, we're not sure he ever sent a bill. And he rarely needed specialists. Some sample storylines from Marcus Welby, and they were somewhat um, uh, advanced in their thinking, including uh, the modern age uh, illnesses of impotence, depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he also did create controversy. Indeed, in 1973, there was an episode called The Other Martin Loring, which was about a middle-aged man whom Welby advised to resist his homosexual impulses after which the Gay Active Alliance uh, boycotted ABC. And then, um, let's see, in the following year, uh, an episode on, uh, called The Outrage uh, sparked national attention uh, with the story of a teenage student being sexually assaulted by his male teacher, uh, which conflated homosexuality with pedophilia. And even as of uh, 2012, uh, this story would have been pertinent. Well, what was Welby's downfall? Uh, it had to do with the evolution in health and health systems, and both occurred simultaneously. As you've heard and are seeing transitioning, our current healthcare system created, it was, excuse me, created at a time when most patients suffered from acute, often infectious conditions that needed immediate attention. And that's no longer true today. The majority of our patients have modern, lifestyle conditions outside of inflammatory bowel disease, or maybe uh, we'll identify that in the future. Uh, obviously, diabetes, high blood pressure, 
uh, obesity, coronary artery disease, are diseases of, um, often related to lifestyle and require chronic care rather than the acute care. Uh, in the past, it was made sense to organize healthcare into subspecialties that would treat these acute current conditions, uh, but health has changed in the United States and around the world. By the time the patient needs a specialist, um, in many of those cases, it would be fair to say that medicine has already failed the patients who have become obese, diabetic, uh, and with coronary disease. There have been extensive changes since Welby's era. Um, at that time, the typical model was a male physician who plunged into medicine supported by a spouse who often gave up any work aspirations of their own. Um, nowadays, newer doctors, as you all know, often have working partners and both share responsibility for raising the children or caring for their elderly parents. At the time of Welby in 1977, only about 20% of medical school graduates were women. Now it's uh, approximately half. And uh, in the past year, 20% of male doctors and, and nearly half of uh, females are employed by medical groups. Um, and that was compared to less than 10% and less than a third only seven years ago. So we see this rapid evolution of change that uh, you've heard extensively uh, this afternoon. Um, in addition, there are changes uh, in doctors coming out of medical school um, and into residency. There's, there are lifestyle changes for those who are entering into medicine. Uh, it was way back uh, in 2003 that we all lamented that work was then limited to an 80-hour work week to, quote, improve the grueling schedules that we all went through in the medical and to reduce medical mistakes, which it hasn't. Uh, in 2011, residents were limited to 16-hour shifts. And uh, in 2011, survey of senior medical residents found that only 1% wanted to work as a solo practitioner or in a partnership such as Marcus, uh, Marcus Welby. Nowadays, the average medical school graduate faces over $150,000 in debt, um, which has led to rising numbers seeking training and programs in high-paying specialties, which used to be gastroenterology and others. Now they're moving into ER, anesthesiology, radiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, which all offer better pay work and hours than in primary care. But according to what we're hearing from John, that's likely to change in the very near future as well. So indeed, although there's been a de decrease in primary care, demand for primary care services are likely to increase in the coming years. And you heard John talk about several models where primary cares may be engaged with the high-risk individuals. Many of those are our patients with IBD and whether uh, probably we are taking over that primary care uh, and we're doing cognitive services rather than uh, technical services. You've heard about the change, and I'm just going to quickly go through this because um, uh, John and Bob Burkoff have uh, gone through this extensively, how insurance incentives are changing from visits to value, and I won't go into that further. There are newer roles for healthcare practitioners, which are being encompassed into this healthcare delivery that John was talking about, which are now we are all encompassing, nurse practitioners, um, pharmacists coming into our practice, um, dietitians, et cetera. And there's been a change in that consumers expect to see these individuals and trust them and don't feel that their care is, is compromised. So just as the doctors coming out of medical school and the residents are changing, the population is changing their expectations as well. We all used to, we thought that everyone wanted a Marcus Welby. But as young physicians come in and want lifestyle changes, uh, the population is willing to accept alternatives. And as you've heard from John, consumers are about to manage their own primary health more aggressively, not only by going to the internet, um, et cetera, but we're going to be choosing our healthcare exchanges, as you've heard. And consumers are embracing 
self-care as a possibility and are using these online tools. So some of us who are approaching the uh, well-be generation uh, need to adapt as the younger physicians and as our population is adapting as well. So what is today's reality? It's all but impossible for doctors today to be Marcus Welby. And we see what's happening. The volume of patients has increased substantially and will grow as the population ages and as the uninsured get coverage and seek medical care. And that's combined with a shortage of primary care, huge increase in the administrative costs, and as we continue to understand, a decreasing reimbursement, which means that doctors will be spending less time with individual patients. And uh, Bob Bierkoff mentioned that it takes three minutes to fill out his SCAMP record. That's three out of the 15 minutes to fill out something that hasn't been proven as yet. Medical costs are obviously increasing based on the technology that we and others are employing and based on the uh, explosion of specialty care. Of course, much of this, we think, <clears throat> may be driven by malpractice exposure, but nevertheless, cognitive costs are, or cognitive uh, pricing is going down in res in, with respect to the technical fees for um, uh, the uh, diagnostics. This is uh, the tapping of expensive technology worsens the financial crisis that, that we face in healthcare, and that's going to be um, accounted for in the bundling of services that John Allen mentioned, but also leads to less money available to cover the cost of physicians spending more time with our patients. So <clears throat> in addition, since the Welby days, there's been an explosion in medical information, multitudes of clinical trials, the emergence of evidence-based medicine leading to the best practices that Bob Yurkoff was talked about, talking about based on data. But no physician can keep up with all of this and all of the advances even in the literature, which is why you all come here for two days of intensive training on inflammatory bowel disease. And we're going to need to rely on the tools that John is mentioning that are going to be on board and uh, available on our iPads and uh, um, uh, on the computers and on our iPhones to, to help us with the rapidly advancing technology and medical information. So to cope with information, the information revolution, and to keep step with the burgeoning development of new pharmaceuticals on a daily basis and, and evolving that we're talking about here, new devices and invasive and non-invasive technologies requires both knowledge and often decision support through the programs that we are going to be developing online through our organizations, whether it's the AGA, ACG, CCFA, et cetera. And these and many other factors have driven uh, many graduates away from the primary care. Imagine how difficult it is for us to assimilate the changes in IBD alone. And what a small piece of the sliver this is for someone expected to be a generalist nowadays. <clears throat> and then, of course, there is uh, Obamacare which we've heard envisions that doctors will fold their private practices to become salaried hospital or accountable care employees. It's going to make it easier for the government to regulate us. And to get this uh, control, the accountable care organizations are basically hospitals coupled with the local doctor networks that we heard about uh, that John so ably described. So we need to recognize the crucial importance of integrative uh, care, whether it's primary or more extensive primary and specialty care, uh, these policies continue to evolve in the realm that we've uh, heard about this afternoon. But nevertheless, there still is room for the caring physician. And uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago, David Meltzer, who's a health economist, describes a huge literature suggesting that elements of the doctor-patient relationship, including trust, interpersonal relations, communication, and knowledge of the patient, are all associated with lowering of the health care costs. Whether this is going to be done by Marcus Welby or the health care team that we're going to need to assimilate, and in IBD, it may be not only um, our physicians and our nurses and physician assistants, but social workers, dietitians, pharmacists, uh, 
uh, working together for the patients. Um, if Obamacare really called for the creation of death panels, the first victim would have been Marcus Welby. Oops, excuse me. And um, thanks to Obamacare, Marcus Welby is taking down his shingles and becoming an employee of General Hospital. So there was a real life Marcus Welby. Um, our mentor, my mentor, uh, those of us at the University of Chicago, and, and many of us were impacted by uh, Dr. Kersner, who passed away uh, just this past July. He would have been considered a Marcus Welby of uh, gastroenterology, but the reality was passing away at 103 and giving up patient care more than 15 years ago um, he prob I can guarantee you he would not have existed in today's healthcare environment. So uh, Marcus, you can uh, rest in peace along with your counterparts, the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. Thank you. <laughs>